Aren't they cute? But basically an amazing, amazing initiative from Dr. Mitra. Uh, again, started with one of those computers and now they've deployed them across India and also in different countries. Uh, Sugata was saying education technology should reach the underprivileged first. Because if you think of the impact on kids like this compared to you know, children coming from a, uh, you know, from the, the higher society, uh, it's, it's amazing how you can change really the life of these children that has basically don't even have access to education. Um, a few things about this technology, uh, what, what they've deployed is often the way that the children learn is co collaborating between each other. Often you will have two or three children in front of the screen. There's another row of kids that are looking but also giving advice, try this, do this. And there's a third, a second row of kids, and sometimes you, you might have seen one on, in a poll, like trying to look up from, from behind. Uh, but basically, when they do something and it works, it's not like one kid that has learned something. It's, it's 20 because they're all around, learning together, collaborating between each other, sharing how they understand. These these stations, many of them, it's not just the internet. They do run some education software so that the kids, it's not just random internet. Uh, one thing interesting to note, you might have seen this little cover. Of course, it protects from the rain, but they're about that high. One of the views is that they don't want the parents to go, they want the kids. It's very uncomfortable to be on a computer like that. Um, so, so that this really is helping the children to get a better future life. Um, let's talk about it, it, another initiative, One Laptop Per Child. Uh, the gentleman in the middle is Niklas Negropante. Uh, actually, I don't know if you've ever seen one of these little devices. Uh, but there is one. Uh, about three, four years ago, myself, I did go to MIT, uh, did meet with Niklas, uh, offered my help uh, in Asia to get these devices deployed. And, uh, and that's at the time I left with about 10 of these devices uh, and got a large team in my previous organization. I had about 100 people helping across Asia to deploy these little laptops. So my team had translated them in Chinese when there was a Sichuan earthquake, we ended up deploying these little laptops for the kids who had lost their schools and in many cases were orphans. And, uh, so I was myself very involved in this little device. It's called the XO, by the way, because you see this is a picture of a children, an X, but if you put it this way, it's an X with an O, so they call the PC XO, like a child with, becomes the XO. Uh, it's been uh, a very interesting initiative, uh, it's been deployed in uh, about 35 countries, uh, more than a million of these devices have been deployed, uh, and it's really using collaboration to bring a new form of learning. Uh, these devices are quite different than a regular PC, um, so when you open it, uh, you just you know, lift the little antenna, but this device, if another one is there, can easily connect to it, and we can see each other and start playing games and, and collaborating together, which on a regular PC, try to do that. Very difficult. <laughs> uh, but these were really built for collaboration for kids to, to work together. And by the way, I can pass it around if you want to have a look. Very interesting machines. Um, but basically, let me give you an example of in Uruguay. Uh, the president of Uruguay decided to make this a national priority that every children in the country would get one of those laptops by the end of 2009, and they've succeeded, actually. There's close to 400,000 of these laptops deployed in Uruguay, uh, and it's been an amazing success. Uh, when I was at MIT, uh, meeting with Niklas uh, three, four years ago, I met also with uh, Miguel, Miguel Brescher, who was the head in Uruguay of this deployment, and he was telling an amazing story that came out of this deployment. Uh, one example was, for instance, a school, they took a school where very poor school in a remote area in Uruguay where you know the teacher in the school would have kids from grade 1 to grade 10 or grade 8 in the same class because there's not enough children the teacher in Uruguay and in many poor countries being a teacher is one of the lowest paid job and often I mean in Uruguay if you're not good at school and really unlucky you might become a teacher was one of the say there which, of course, especially in remote area where they're extremely poorly paid, you would end up having teachers that in some cases know hardly, hardly know how to read and write, and they're teaching kids from grade one to grade 12 in one class. You know, think about how these kids learn. So there was this example of this very remote place that they took where the attendance in the class was less than 50% every day, because parents prefer to keep their kids home to do work on the farm with the fruits, 
And there was a story of this kid who actually, he got one of those laptop and started to search the net. His parents were harvesting some kind of fruits. And the kid found on the internet that the way they were cutting the branch in the fall was not the right approach with the trees and show them how to cut it properly. So the next season, the parents cut it properly. And then next year, they have 30% more fruits. So suddenly, they wanted their kid every day to go to school because this was good for money. And these kind of stories started to snowball. And in that specific school, suddenly, the attendance was 100%. Every kid needed to work where we're going or had to be really sick for, not, for them not to go. Not only that, the school would start at 8 around 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning, kids would go around the school and all sit down with their little green laptop because that was their only access to information. They're so eager to learn that they would arrive at school an hour, two hours later. Uh, so some amazing, amazing story that came out from the one laptop per child. Let's go look at other alter initiatives, uh, other things that have been done. We're getting to the other spectrum here, uh, you know, rich universities. Uh, but the Brigham Young uh, University in Utah, uh, they, David Whaley, uh, a few years ago, like uh, back in 2006, decided that he wanted his students to post homework on publicly accessible blogs and so that anyone around the world could see their homework. And he encouraged his students to comment on each other's work. And basically, a week later, his st students started to post comments on each other's work and within a week, the writing changed. Students started, because now that they saw other students were reading their work, they wanted to make it better. They spent more time at it. The, the writing was longer, was more better research. They started to see reference to homework of other students. Uh, and basically, uh, you know, a few weeks later, it started to attract some professionals from outside that started to comment on some of their homework. And the work even got better, because suddenly, you know, the students realized that their homework was potentially useful. It wasn't just something they gave to a teacher or a professor that was just to get it ready. Uh, so since then, um, I guess David has been doing that in all his classes, and it's been a very, very interesting success. Uh, let's look at another initiative at MIT. Uh, 8.02, uh, it's a class called Electricity and Magnetism, which is the toughest class when you're in the first year at MIT. Very, very difficult class. Uh, the failure rate was 75%. Of course, as a parent, your kids got straight A for four years. That's what it takes to get to MIT. Uh, then you pay, you know, 40, 50,000 US dollars per year, and your kid failed his first class. That, you know, did upset quite a few parents and kids. So MIT was really trying to find a new way to teach this class because, but it's a tough class. I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to pass this class. So they decided to implement this concept of studio, the studio concept that was used by other universities and very, very successful, which is more this principle, you know, it's, it's a principle of architecture class where you have round tables and people collaborate, work between each other, teachers goes around, discuss with, you know, generate discussion within the tables and it's not just a teacher in front, you know, a sage on stage basically that just gives information. So you see a little picture here of this studio concept. So of course their view was, well, that's going to be a great success. It's worked in other places. Well, first round did not go well. Uh, and actually what they realized was the teacher uh, had to be retrained because they were just used to be a sage on stage, which now the class, half of them were facing back and it just became more difficult and because they were not necessarily you know, they were great professors, but not necessarily great mentors or great facilitators. They had to be retrained. So during the summer, they ran a retraining program to the teachers. And we're pretty sure now, we, now we're going to get it, right? Because we're ready. Let's go for it. Second round still did not work. And what they realized was actually they were marking, still marking based on a curve. So the teacher was still trying to fail a very good percentage of the class. But if you're trying to make a concept of collaboration, if I know that the teacher will want to fail half of the class, well, the more I help you, the more I have chances to fail. So again, you know, it wasn't really working. And they realized they had to change completely the teaching practice and mark differently. So 
Again, third round went pretty well, but all that to say that um, you know, changing the style and bringing technology is not the only thing. They had to change their complete teaching practice to make it work properly. Uh, let's look at another uh, studio environment at North Carolina State University, which actually was the, the project that had inspired MIT to do it. Uh, they, they've been running this with lots of students. They've, they've had data for, from more than 16,000 students going through that st studio concept. And, and basically, their results, and they ran a lot of study to look at it, was that you know, the ability to solve problems is improved, uh, the conceptual understanding is increased, the attitude is improved by the kids, the failure rate is drastically reduced. And you'll see on my next chart, I have a chart from them that shows exactly the difference in failure rate just by changing the teaching practice and the new methodology. Uh, and the at-risk students actually did better in later engineering class because if they, they succeeded in a very, very tough class, it changed completely their attitude towards later classes. Um, this table looks fairly complex, but the only thing you need to worry about is the last column, is a reduction in failure rate using the studio concept versus the regular concept from NCSU. So if you look at female, the third line in, the, uh, in there, in the table, 4.7, that means 4.7 times reduction of failure rate specifically for women, uh, and, and so on. The average is about 3 point something. So from you know a 70% failure rate, you're suddenly in the 20. Amazing, amazing changes just by changing the basic concept of how to teach with to the kids. Uh, let's look at a study done at Harvard. Uh, Harvard looked at, again, Harvard is one of those universities that you can only get in if you've got straight A's and if you're very lucky. Um, but then you still have you know, many kids that once in there do not make it. So they did a study of what's the single best predictor <coughs> of being successful at Harvard. Uh, actually, the answer lies in this picture. And what this picture is, is the ability of students to join collaborative study group. Collaborative study group uh, is used at Harvard. It's used in other universities as well. Is this concept, you know, after a class, one student decides to create a collaborative study group, which means let's get together for an hour or two, let's share our understanding of what happened in the class, let's you know, talk among each other to really make sure we all understand what has happened there, maybe do study together, uh, and the more you participate in that in Harvard, the more you'll be successful. If you create one of those groups and you lead it, you'll be even more successful. That's the single best predictor of being successful at Harvard. Again, it comes back to this collaboration learning. Uh, let's look at, about other initiatives, Netlibris Literature Circle in Finland. Uh, but before going there, I just want to talk a little bit about Finland. Because Finland is, to me, a very, very interesting country in terms of their education system. They have a completely different philosophy than most countries. Uh, they start school later than everybody else. Uh, the first year at school is at age seven, not age five or three, like in Singapore, <laughs> uh, but it's basically, they, their philosophy is that you shouldn't start school too early before your brain is developed enough, so they start one to two years later than most countries, but at grade, you know, at age 10, they get the best score from any country in the world, which is, wow, you know, how do they do this? Uh, but again, their principle of schools is quite different. Uh, being a teacher in Finland is very difficult. It's a very well-paid job. It's very, you need at least a master degree. And you're, it's, they're very, very selective in getting their teacher. They don't allow competition between schools. They don't allow competition with, between kids. Uh, they often have two to three teachers per class. Uh, the kids that have more difficulty, there's teachers there to help those kids specifically with them. Uh, a lot of trust in the kids. So if the kids get to school, they have to take off their shoes and it's a lot more relaxed. The kids goes in front, shows other kids uh, how to do things, so they participate a lot more than a, a usual school. But you would get a PE teacher, for instance, of course Finland is a cold country in the winter, but let's say they, they go for some cross-country skiing, he would name one of the kids to say, you lead the group, and you come back in two hours, and there's no teacher going with that. And one of the kids is the leader, they go, they do the activity, they come back, and again, this trusting with the children, very, very different. And somehow, after three years, they get the best score in math science than any countries in the world. And you kind of think, hmm, there must be something good they do there. 